So where I'd actually like to start is a resource that could be uh, really helpful to you, which is this supplement uh, for Warhammer Ancient Battles Fall of the West. Now, this is actually out of print, um, unfortunately, like all the, the Ancient Battles stuff. But um, if you can find this on eBay or wherever secondhand, I think it would be uh, an invaluable resource. And this book will actually be our guide for um, taking us through collecting this army. Now, do you have to use this? Absolutely not. Um, in fact, I'd really encourage you to, to read real history books rather than just stuff like this. But um, it can be a really helpful tool to, to help us through the process and break things down. So the book itself actually has lots of great pictures, um, as do all of the uh, Warhammer Ancient Battles supplement, supplements in the main rule book themselves. They have kind of how to paint guides, stuff like that. Um, these great illustrations as well, as well as pictures of models. Um, but if we look at the table of contents, you can see that this book has a ton of um, useful information to you. It's got the basic history of the period, um, De lots of details about different elements of the Roman armies, the barbarians, uh, leaders of the time period, some battles. It has a campaign built in um, and whatnot, as well as uh, there's just a wealth of information is what I'm trying to say, as well as the generic army lists. Um, and it's, I think it's a real shame that there are not – no one's really putting any books like this out um, anymore, as far as I can tell. Like the Hail Caesar books – have nothing like this kind of information. Most rule books just give you um, very like generic information, right? They don't really talk about. Um, they give you what they give you the army list, but they don't talk about the actual time period. So the section that we're going to kind of look at is how to collect an army. Um, so that's what. So that's so, where um, just before we go there, I will give you a little more of a plug. Why you, a reason to get this book. Whether you game this system or not, I don't think it matters. You can kind of ignore the stats for the rules. But just things like this picture section, um, and these are all from the Perry collection, um, I believe. These picture sections, um, the illustrations, color illustrations, shield designs, stuff like this. Um, I just really think this kind of stuff all in one place is just invaluable. All right, so... How to collect an army. Now, I'm going to say this right off the bat. So we're looking at 28 mil, um, although this would apply to any scale. All my stuff is 28 mil. Um, but what I really want to talk about is the thematic ideas on collecting your army. And we're going to be looking at the Romans today, so we won't talk about the barbarians. But I just love this passage, and I think it's a great um, introduction. So um, the author writes, Are you a Roman nobleman? Is your blood so blue that you can sign peace treaties by dipping quills in it? Is your upper lip so stiff that you can crack nuts? Was your great-great-grandfather a personal toady to the divine Julius? And have several of your relatives committed suicide after a treason trial? If so, you are a lantern bearer, holding back the night. One day Rome might disappear, deluged under a sea of bare-bottomed barbarians, but not while there is breath in your body." Not while you stand protecting, protected by your bodyguards, skillfully moving your well-drilled units around the battlefield to confuse and tear apart unwashed hordes, many times their number. Not while your men stand in their disciplined ranks, unlettered but fine lands, all of them, real rough diamonds. So... Um, we'll skip the part about the barbarians for now, but so choose the right general and spend a little time getting that extra special paint job. This figure is your representative on the battlefield and your troops will not give their best for a sloppy leader. So what do we mean by the late Roman period? So when you get into the Roman history, it gets very confusing. Um, so you have the whole Republic period. Um, in kind of the before the AD times, basically all, everything that's BC um, or CE, whatever you, or BCE, whatever you want to say, everything that's BC is uh, going to be Republican Roman up until about 50 BC. Um, that's when you kind of get Julius Caesar and then eventually Augustus and the Republic becomes an empire. 
And you have a kind of the fall of the Republic with Julius Caesar and Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. That, that's when all that stuff is. Um, fast forward, um, the late Roman period, we're looking at kind of the end of the Roman Empire when it transitions from being a Republic to an empire. Um, and now it's the end of that empire. So you kind of have the glory days, um, you know, the height of Rome's power, I guess, is in the first and second centuries AD. Um, that's, you know, the, the early empire. So one thing that can be really um, confusing when you're shopping for models, if you're not familiar with the period, is you have stuff labeled as late Republican or early imperial. The early imperial stuff comes after the late Republican stuff, um, which can be kind of confusing to the novice um, getting into this. So we're looking at the late empire. So kind of the fall of the empire, um, roughly speaking, kind of fourth, fifth centuries um, AD. And then you even have kind of these post Roman, but Roman-esque or sub-Roman kingdoms even into the, uh, the sixth century. So that is kind of where we're going to be talking about. And uh, this is a period of kind of decline, maybe from the, the height of its power. But even this late period, it'd be wrong to just lump it all together, uh, even though that's what we do. Um, the early late Roman period, and again, it gets getting confusing. Rome is still very much the big dog on the block. They're still extremely powerful. Um, it's really not until the, the very end when Rome's power really decreases. So even for most of this period, the average Roman soldier or unit is going to be far superior to the uh, to their enemies for the most part. So um, where are we starting? What you want to start with is a general. Now, depending on the rule system, um, you're going to your generals may or may not look different. So I think this general would technically be saga legal. I'm not quite sure. Um, if the base is a little too large, but I like to have multiple figures on my command bases, but that is where I would start. Now, if you're playing a larger rule set um, that has multiple kind of divisions in it, like to the strongest or Hail Caesar, you're gonna need probably at least two of these guys, if not three to four or even five. So um, these figures over here, they are from West Wind um, models or whatever they're called. Uh, so they're kind of a smaller company. They're from the Arthurian range. You'll have to dig. And they come with separate heads. And I ended up actually sticking uh, Vitrix plastic heads onto them. Um, so your commander, you'd, I'd look for figures like these. Um, and obviously people, places sell command packs. But really your general probably should be mounted. If you want the emperor taking the field, uh, probably should be dressed in purple. So here we got a bigger command base. So um, this guy is from Footsore Miniatures. They are another good place to go to. And then everyone else on the base is from uh, Aventine Miniatures. And they're technically early Byzantines, but I think they fit well um, with the Footsore stuff. And I highly, highly recommend these. Um, so yeah. Not a ton to say about the um, commanders, you know, most manufacturers obviously just sell command sets, but get someone with a bit of character, give them a slightly nicer paint job uh, than you usually would. And then these guys obviously still need to finish the basing on them. Um, but you want your commander looking their best. Now, generally at Roman commanders, they're not gonna be getting stuck into the fighting. They're gonna be more kind of behind the lines, giving orders. Um, their focus is more on command rather, command and control rather than um, heroics, I would say. Now, if you're gaming the very late period, then you may also um, need a barbarian chieftain to aid you along. So especially, um, I mean, if you're in the sub-Roman period, like after the empire really falls, 100% you're going to need some barbarian allies. And I'm thinking kind of like... Arthurian Britain. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the uh, the dude, but um, the Saxons, you know, according to legend, anyways, uh, are first called over to fight as mercenaries for um, one of the British leaders, whose uh, whose name I'm just totally blanking on at the moment. Um, but also uh, during the empire, 
At the very end of the period, um, barbarian allies called Fodorati, Fodorati become even more important. Um, and they would be coming in under their own leaders, fighting in their own separate units. Um, so you might need a barbarian leader to lead a division of Fodorati if you're doing that in the late period. So next, Warhammer Ancient Battles writes, um, next, start collecting the soldiers one unit at a time. We like to start with a cavalry unit after they all they are the senior service. A Roman cavalry unit from the mobile army consisted of about 250 to 300 men. If we use a 50 to 1 ratio, then a unit will be 5 to 6 men. Infantry auxiliary. So we'll stop there. So the book next, next recommends getting cavalry as they are the senior service. So in the late Roman army, the cavalry greatly increase um, in importance um, to a much greater extent than they were in the, the earlier times during the, uh, the early Imperial Roman times. So most of your cavalry are going to look something like this, your kind of generic heavy cavalry. So um, where are my cavalry from? They are a mix of War Games Foundry, Footsore Miniatures, and gripping beast plastics as well. Um, and I find all those companies actually fit quite well together. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't think any of the models really stand out as being, you know, unusual. All right, so um, that's what your kind of regular cavalry are gonna look like. Um, although there were other kinds of cavalry as well that we'll get into. But that might be a good starting point. After you got your commander done, you get your cavalry. So we're building our little Roman army over here. So we've got our unit of cavalry and we've got our commander. So next, what we need to do is start getting the poor bloody infantry um, involved. And we got several things to talk about here. So pretty much any general during this time period, Roman, barbarian, or whatever, is going to be mounted um, for the most part, I should say, not like 100% of the time. But they're probably going to be mounted and they're going to have a bodyguard. So that is maybe what we have here. We've got our commander and their bodyguard of cavalry. Now, what I would really do, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but I never write a script for my videos. <laughs> but what I would do is I would start reading some history and I would really pick a period to kind of base my army off and give it a theme um, and pick that and use that to kind of guide my choices going forward. Um, so what kind of army is this going to be? And we got several kind of options. So we got our commander. Who is this guy? What's his story? What kind of army is he leading um, in this period? So now we have some things to really talk All about. All right, so... As we're getting into the late Roman army, the organization is very different from the earlier period. So if you're familiar with the, uh, the early Imperial Romans, they have legions, legionaries, and auxiliaries as their kind of main basic infantry. And legions in the early Imperial Roman period are about 5,000 men strong or so. Uh, rounding roughly. They're about 5,000 men. Uh, when we get into the late Roman period, uh, we still have legions and auxilia, but it's a lot more complicated. Um, and legions do not necessarily have the special status that they had uh, in the earlier period. So the way I have organized my forces is here we've got a legion in the back and a unit of auxilia in the front. And Again, in the early, so in the early imperial period, a legion would be composed of about 5,000 men, and auxiliaries were only on the cohort level, and they'd be composed of about 480 men. Um, now that we're in the late period, legions are down to about 1,000 men each. So they're about a fifth of the size. They're much, much smaller. So the way I've done my forces is each one of these blocks is 500 men so together we have a thousand man legion and then we have a unit of auxiliaries in the front um who would be just you know half the size um three three of these bases instead of six bases um so why are the legions so much smaller basically 
5,000 men uh, in the, the earlier legions proved to be kind of impractical for um, what the Roman Empire was trying to do at that time. So 5,000 men was great while the, uh, the empire was expanding and they needed all these troops in one place to kind of expand the borders and whatnot. But once the borders kind of settled down in the, the second century AD, suddenly these big blocks of men were actually quite, um, they are too inflexible and they ended up getting broken up anyways. So you'd have um, these legions, even though they were one legion, um, you know, in theory, they would be penny packeted out, broken up. They'd be in lots of different garrisons. Um, if the emperor went on campaign, some of the troops would be left to guard the borders um, and other troops from that legion would be drafted in to fight. So you might only have half the legion out on campaign, half um, in garrison, and even then broken out into different garrisons and then dispatched for different missions and whatnot. So Basically, that's where these smaller legions evolve out of because they weren't ever really being fielded as 5,000 man legions um, before. So that is our first essential difference is between legions and auxilia. And again, uh, to recap in this period, the real difference between them is just the size. So a legion, 1,000 men, auxilia, 500 men or so. And... There's no real status difference between the legions and the auxilia per se during this period. Um, and that is because everyone born in the empire at this time had citizenship. So um, basically citizenship stopped being as important as it was previously. Um, but let's move on. So our next big difference, um, I've got we've got the legion in front of us and the legion in front of us happens to be the Legion of the Jovians. Um, and we have uh, this organizational difference between legions and auxilia, but our next big difference is quality. So legions in auxilia during this time period come in basically three different qualities. And I'll kind of want to talk about how I am modeling that. So the highest quality troops were the Palatina troops, and that basically means palace troops. Uh, and then this time, the center of power during the Roman Empire really shifts away from being the city of Rome itself and being the armies. Um, and really, most of the times, the, the emperors would be running the armies uh, in a lot of cases. Um, so the Palatine troops or the palace troops, they would be the, uh, the emperor's bodyguards. And top, basically, the top troops with the best equipment, training, what have you um, in the empire. So the way I've modeled these guys is I've done these um, painted spears. Um, the shield design is the shield design of the Jovians and I've given all of the troops armor. I've given them crests when I've, uh, you know, been lazy enough to, or not lazy enough to do it. And I've also, you know, given them full armor. I've given them red cloaks to kind of tie them together. Um, I basically tried to make them look as elite as possible. So that is going to be your, the best troops in a late Roman army are those Palatine troops, um, the palace troops. Now you might be th wondering about the Praetorian Guard. If you, you've heard of the Romans, you probably heard of the Praetorian Guard. The Palatine troops basically replace the Palatine, uh, the Palatine troops replace the Praetorian Guard. And that happens under uh, Emperor Constantine, the same one who introduces Christianity. He um, basically, he defeats um, the Praetorian Guard when he comes to the, the throne and he disbands them and replaces them with his own troops. Um, and now one thing to note is that both legions and auxilia can be palatine uh, troops, okay? So the legion and versus auxiliary, it's really only about size um, in this time period, the size of the units. You have both palatine uh, legions and you have palatine, auxilia palatina as well, okay? So top level troops are your palatine troops. So your next level of troops are gonna be the comitatensis. And now this is, um, so basically what are the comitatensis? Well, they are what's called the mobile field armies. Now, the late Roman history is kind of debated um, to a certain extent. Um, 
you know, on the details and we're not, we'll not go into that debate, but basically at this time, you've got the mobile field armies and then the border forces and the comitatenses are the mobile field armies. And basically all the best troops are gonna be in these mobile field armies um, and they're kind of held in reserve. So they wouldn't be on the frontiers of a province. They would be um, kind of in the center. And again, they'd be have excellent training, excellent equipment, um, everything like that, full-time soldiers. So your next grade is the Comitatensis. So they uh, might not be quite as elite and well-equipped as the Palatine troops, but they're still gonna be uh, very well-equipped. And um, for what you could do uh, for your forces is, <clears throat> um, Basically, um, these are going to be, you know, they're not quite as elite as the Palatine, but they're not trash either. They're just really solid professional troops, okay? And those could be uh, legions or auxilia as well in the Comitatensis. All right, so finally, what do we have is we have the last grade of troops, which is the Limitani. Now, these are the border forces. So I mentioned uh, with the Comitatensis, you have these mobile field armies, uh, kind of in the center of the province who are reacting to issues. On the border, you have the, basically the border guards are the Limitani. And there's a lot of debate about them as well. But um, people have postulated that they're kind of of a lower quality than your Comitatensis. They're actually maybe even part-time soldiers. And what they might do is patrol the border, but to support themselves, kind of have farms um, and such. So they'd be kind of so almost kind of like feudalism in a way. They'd be kind of running these farms um, to get their payment. You know, that's how they'd be paid in their farm. And then they would fight um, on the side and they would be kind of the thin crust on the exterior. Um, so who knows really what the quality would be like. And what I did for this unit, you'll see in my other units of matching, very matching shields, stuff. This unit, I wanted to be a lot rougher. So they're mostly unarmored. Um, they've got some kind of Celtic influence, you know, because these soldiers would be marrying in with the local women and whatnot. Um, and also, um, and during this time period, the, the Roman army was really suffering for recruits. So what they did is basically, if your father was a soldier, you were uh, you had to be a soldier as well, and that was true, I think, for every profession in this period. But um, so if you can imagine, they they might get a little wilder over time if they're kind of mixing in with the local population. So that's what we've got for the limitani. So the limitani as well, they could be um, in legion form or in auxilia form. Uh, it's just a question of size. And what you could do, um, the kind of general thing in most war games rules, is these guys would be somehow lower quality than your other troops, whether that would be in their training, in their armor, in their battle testedness. They're not necessarily the strength of your army. Um, so, how might you want to go about organizing your forces in terms of legions and auxilia? So on one hand here, I've got my two Auxilia Palatina units, and then I've got one legion over here. So one legion is basically the same manpower as two auxiliary units. So how do you want to model that on the tabletop? So what I've done is basically done two separate units, but you might want to go about things differently. I think the important thing is that the legion is, whatever you choose to do, twice the size of the auxilia or so. So what you could do, um, for example, if you're playing Hail Caesar maybe, is um, your legion, so if you don't wanna do a legion being two units, is you can make your legion a large unit, maybe add an extra base onto there. So your legion would be a large unit. And then your auxilia units would be just regular sized units. So I think that's one way you could do it uh, if you're looking at Hail Caesar, or you could um, make your auxilia small units and your legions large units or your, your, something like that. Play around with it. Um, 
it's up to you. What they recommend doing in the Warhammer Ancient Battles supplement is having uh, auxilia units being two men, uh, 10 men strong and legions being 20 strong. Um, that is something that you could do as well. So the next thing I wanna talk about is archers. I'm not gonna talk for a huge amount of time on them, but during this period, archery seems to rapidly uh, have increased in importance. And basically um, the, the percentage of the army that would be archers goes way up to possibly even being a quarter of a, or a third of the army being archers. And basically how these may have thought is they're actually kind of in the back of a shield wall. So the late Roman army in this time, they're really fighting in a shield wall kind of formation. So what you could what you can do is have basically the archers attached to the unit. So that way could be one unit, basically. You've got the spearmen in the front and then the archers in the back. Um, so they'd be kind of one unit. Um, so you'd kind of wait, the way you can represent that on the tabletop is the, uh, the infantry unit having some extra shooting power, some extra shooting dice. So uh, in the back here, we have got the Fodorati, the barbarian allies. So these would only um, be in the very kind of end of the period. But uh, when the Romans were really struggling for manpower, they used Gothic Fodorati and uh, Franks as well, particularly. So that would be um, something that you would see in the late period, really late part of the period. Uh, you can add some war bands of barbarians kind of in their own unit. And that's the real big difference is most of the troops in the late Roman army were barbarians um, of Germanic origin. The difference with the Fodorati is that they fought in their own ethnic units as kind of an ethnic whole um, under their own commanders rather than being kind of inducted into the Roman army structure like uh, other barbarians were. So that is something that you might want to add. So here. I know this has been kind of a long rambly um, Listen, uh, what I do want to do is I do want to give you a quick run through on what some different army builds could look like depending on the kind of army that you were going for um, in different parts of the period. And I, I mentioned it, um, but I didn't do a good job of t explaining it, um, theming your army, coming up with a theme. That's what I would really try and do. Is your army one of those kind of elite mobile comitatensis forces? Or is it kind of a Limitani force? Is it a late period force? That's what I want to kind of go through, how you could play around with kind of the composition of your army. All right, so here is our first build. Maybe So this could be a mobile field army force. So a Comitatensis force, um, one of the elite kind of units. So what have we, um, one of the elite armies. So I'll kind of talk you through the build and then we'll look at a Limitani build. So we've got, the core of our troops, basically Comitatensis or Palatina troops, a, a legion, two units of auxiliaries. Um, so these would be elite troops, um, whatever upgrades you can think of, you know, they could potentially have them. Um, we got our commander. We got a unit of heavy cavalry bodyguard or just regular heavy cavalry. Archers, and these could also, again, it would be very suitable to attach these to your infantry units as well. So you could have them as a separate unit or kind of attached on the back, maybe some artillery. Um, and then what might make this army unique, cataphracts. So, you know, how good were these troops actually? Hard to tell, but in one of these elite field armies, you might be seeing some cataphracts. Uh, and then maybe some horse archers from the east. So all in all, um, if you're doing this kind of force, what it should look like, core of solid infantry, um, it should be probably relatively small compared to um, you know your enemy, some cavalry, um, and then maybe some of those special type troops like the cataphracts and the horse archers. All right, so here we have a Limitani build. Now, not radically different from the other one, uh, mainly because I don't have a ton of these troops done, but um, let's talk through it a little bit. So what would your infantry look like? A lot more of the scruffy guys like this. 
and you know your infantry wouldn't necessarily be bad but um they aren't they're not going to be the the hardcore elite infantry so again what i would do is i would have like this front unit i would kind of maybe model the troops a little more like this and they could probably have matching shields you know they're not total irregular troops but um i would play up on the scruffiness just to give those units some character so we got some infantry um our commander archers of course would still be present um what you are going to have in the limitani troops is more cavalry probably because they're kind of these border patrol forces so we've got some light cavalry javelin men and our our unit of heavy cavalry and what you could even you could um increase you could even increase the proportion of cavalry from this so even more cavalry um in this border patrol force but um i would just make the army scruffier they're less elite more cavalry and no fancy units so if you're kind of ro kind of role playing the limitani build you know you don't want any of those cataphracts um you don't want those fancy troops you don't want the horse archers stuff like that um all right, now for our final build, this would be a really kind of late period build. It could be even like a sub-Roman Arthurian build. So our infantry, you know, a couple units of um, kind of medium tier infantry would be appropriate, um, you know, depending on, you know, your time period, they could be kind of a different quality. Um, our general would have his bodyguard of cavalry, and then we would have the war bands, allied war bands. So a, a decent proportion of the army made up of the allied Fodorati. So that could be um, another kind of build you would go for. A lot less maybe cavalry, more of the barbarian warriors, um, not as much skilled troops. Probably the best troops in the army would be the kind of bodyguard troops. You could kind of go, um, you know, those could be really elite troops. So the last thing I want to say in this video is that really the um, the sky is the limit for uh, collecting um, a late Roman force in this period. So I give you an example of maybe three different builds. I know that that wasn't maybe like perfect um, representations, but you could even go well beyond what I showed you. So for example, if you were interested in doing like a North Africa, you know, a North African army, that army could almost be entirely uh, light cavalry, even in this, in the Roman period. Um, if you look at the, the forces there, North Africa, um, you know, even under the Roman army, it was a lot of auxiliary cavalry. That's something you could do. So um, that's what I think is cool about Pick a commander, maybe research, you can even research a historical commander and base your army off of his. Um, so, for example, Aetius, he's kind of called the last Roman. Um, he, he had a Hunnic bodyguard. He actually, um, for a long time, his army was mainly composed of Huns because he did kind of a, um, I don't know if you want to call it study abroad uh, situation with the Huns. As a child, he actually grew up in Hunnic society. He had a lot of Hun uh, mercenaries um, as part of his force. So if you're doing an, an Aetius army, you could build it around Huns, like horse archers and stuff. That's something that you could do. Um, you could do the Bagudai, who are kind of these bandits. You could do a, a really irregular light infantry army. Um, they're just the sky is really the limit in different directions you could take a late Roman period force. Um, there's no one right or wrong way to do it. Um, so that's going to be it for this video. I think the next one um, on this topic, we might be doing taking a look, a look at painting, um, but I'll see you in the next one.